Uh, first person on the YouTube today is uh, Stephen in Taunton. Good morning from Upstate New York. Uh, says Candia. Andrew's in Bristol. James is from is in Canary Wharf. Give you a wave out the window. Uh, Des is in Cambridge. Uh, it's miserable in Swansea. Says Gareth. I mean, we know that. I, mean, I don't know if that's a general point or just talking about the weather. Uh, Rachel's in Yorkshire. So let us know where you are uh, this morning. We are live. We are live. We're getting ready for PMQs unpacked, but it's Deputy PMQs unpacked uh, this week. Lara Spirit's here to explain why. Hello. 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 Uh, so we are not going to be having uh, Sir Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak because they will be attending the funeral of uh, Betty Boothroyd, who, the former common speaker who's passed away. Yes, and I think we've uh, they've they've just recently arrived at the uh, at the funeral service. So um, uh, so that's why. So we've got Dominic Raab and Angela Rayner. Uh, the last time they... No, it was the time before last he winked at her. Yes. One of the most appalling things that's ever happened in the House of Commons. One of the most repulsive things I think we've ever had to see, <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do, you think, what do you think she'll go on today? There's quite a lot. I mean, she could do barges, she could do bullying, she could do uh, antisocial behaviour, will she just go for knockabout, will she do policy, what do you think? Yeah, it's interesting because of course they have a very different dynamic to when we see Rishi Sunak and Sakir Starmer, you know, Angela Arena is, is, a, is a bigger character. I think probably uh, likely that we'll see something of a continuation from the approach that we've seen from Keir Starmer with regards to different public services. They, in Prime Minister's questions last week, we saw crime, uh, but very, you know, generally we do tend to see one uh, particular form of or, or aspect of the welfare state, which in uh, Labour's view and, and most people's view is, is has been underperforming and indeed has deteriorated since uh, the Conservatives took over government many years ago. Uh, so I think likely that you might see something on that. It'll be interesting to see how Dominic uh, Raab chooses to respond to what Angela Rayner says, I think, uh, particularly with regards to the future of Jeremy Corbyn, who of course is a natural uh, political ally of Angela Rayner. Uh, Angela Rayner, the, deputy, uh, the shadow deputy prime minister, was of course quite conspicuously absent from that vote at the NEC uh, yesterday and her uh, union yeah, abstained. Yeah. So whether or not she wants to be pinpointed, it's, it's it's very unlikely that you would hear the same language, I think, from Angela Rayner, and few would expect you would, to that which you heard from uh, the Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting this morning, who very unambiguously uh, condemned Jeremy Corbyn and supported the action of Sir Keir Starmer in ensuring that he would be uh, barred from standing as a Labour candidate in his constituency of Islington North in the next election. Fabulous. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, get, well, it all starts in, what, about 10 minutes' time, and then you'll be back with rounding up the best of the rest. The best of the rest, which will be very interesting, of course, given, uh, you know, K uh, Kate Forbes and Hamza Yousaf and, uh, yes. and the evolving spats within the SNP. I think it'll be interesting to see that. Who will be asking questions on behalf of the SNP? Stephen Flynn, we'd hope. No, because no? it's deputies. Does that mean that... Marby Black? Ah. There we are. We'll check. But you will find out. We'll, we'll, find, we'll out. find out a bit later on. Uh, Lara Spirit will be back. Uh, yeah, you can watch along. We are live right now on the YouTube channel. Hi from Wiltshire, says Wendy. Hello from Both Bothwell, says Mary. Madge says, I expect to see the vein throbbing. I think, I think you're probably looking for a different website uh, for that sort of uh, content. Uh, hello, from Mo <laughs> hello from Moist Plymouth, says Mickey. Uh, and um, Stefan. Stuff has been in touch. So it must be said, Matt Chorley's show is so good. His programme today is like catching a big dose of joy. I've literally audibly laughed out loud, he says. Haven't we all, Stefan? Uh, that's lovely. Right, now then. Come on, concentrate. This is serious. Uh, we've been discussing a lot this week about uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, as uh, Laura was just saying, uh, Keir Starmer moved against uh, Jeremy Corbyn yesterday, getting the NEC to vote that he can't stand for Labour again. Uh, despite being the MP in Islington North since, what, 1983. So, does he actually have a chance? Uh, <laughs> is it possible to stand as an independent against your old party and win? Here's the former Labour MP, uh, Frank Field, now Lawfield, of course, nominated Jeremy Corbyn for the leadership and later uh, regretted it. He uh, got the boot uh, from the Labour Party, stood as an independent in 2019. He told me about it recently. Corbyn will have all ragtag and bobtail... <laughs> coming from all over the country to help him. So I would advise him to stand. I think he has a good chance of winning. And that, in the long run, might be good for more people in future being prepared to fight when they think the party has been behaved badly to them. You can hear that whole interview, actually, is on the Red Box podcast. It was pretty extraordinary. Uh, Frank Field uh, there uh, is terminally ill, but he's still keeping going. He was given weeks to live about two two years ago. Hell of an interview. But it's interesting the point he was making, even though he doesn't really agree with Jeremy Corbyn, he thinks if he stood in Islington North, he might be able to win. But how easy is it to do that? 
how strong is your personal brand, really? Let's speak to David Gork. He was Conservative MP, former Cabinet Minister. He lost the whip during the Brexit wars, so stood as an independent in 2019. And he joins me now. Hi, David. Hi, Matt. Uh, without giving away the ending to this, what happened when you stood as an independent? I came second. Uh, so it was um, it was a respectable respectable vote. So I got nearly sixteen thousand votes and twenty six percent of the vote, but that's not enough to win. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't really know at the beginning of the process, you know, what was likely to happen. I didn't really think there was much prospects of me winning, but I wanted to sort of make a point. Um, but I had Labour and the Liberal Democrats standing, and you know the Greens, and I, you know, I was sort of slightly worried that I might end up finishing, you know, third or fourth. Um, but we got lots of volunteers, you know, lovely people from within the constituency and from outside came along, helped out cross party. Um, and to be honest, the campaign was tremendous fun, at least until they started counting the votes. <laughs> I mean, famously, iconically, uh, your dad appeared in one of your campaign videos, I seem to remember. He, he did, yeah, which which he loved and it, it, yeah, it went viral. So, so maybe Jeremy Corbyn could think about that. But there are risks with him. What, think about campaign. using your dad. Well, look, I, I don't think my father will endorse Jeremy Corbyn, but I'm a little bit worried about Jeremy Corbyn's family members. I think he should probably steer clear. Yeah, maybe, maybe not getting his brother on too. So I suppose what, it, it's a real test of independent brand versus party. And actually, the fact that you, you're quite right, the fact that you you did get 26% uh, of the vote is a pretty good endorsement of you you personally. Um, but do you think M MPs, politicians like to over-exaggerate in their own minds their personal brand versus actually the big party the big party vote? Yeah, I, I think they do. I mean, I was helped by the, the fact that there was a big issue that existed at the last general election, which was about Brexit and, you know, Boris Johnson's handling of Brexit. And so, I mean, I'd like to think there were some personal votes there, but but largely I was the kind of the, the, the non-Tory candidate who had perhaps a chance of winning. And so I got lots of tactical votes. Um, so I don't want to sort of, you know, it was because I was a magnificent MP for South West Hertfordshire for 14 years. I think that played a part of it. And I think Jeremy Corbyn needs to be a bit careful that, you know, he can't run a campaign on hasn't the Labour Party treated me badly? And that will be enough to persuade the majority in Islington North to vote for him. Yeah, he needs to have a bit more than that. Um, and he might well do. I mean, he will get lots of activists. As Frank Field said, he will have loads of support and he will have an advantage that I, I didn't. One of my biggest problems was that a lot of voters, particularly conservative minded voters, were sort of thinking, look, at the end of this process, one of two people is going to be prime minister. And I really don't want it to be Jeremy Corbyn. And at least Jeremy Corbyn, when running as an independent, there's no prospect that he'll end up as prime minister. <laughs> so that might, that might help him. And I suppose, actually, given that he'll be, uh, in terms of which way the, the, the political wind is blowing, um, if it looks like there's going to be a Labour government, people, you know, in in his constituency anyway, who you always vote Labour, probably will weigh up, well, a Labour MP versus a Jeremy Corbyn MP is probably... Um, something, something they could live with. Is there any yeah, any, any right. advice? Any advice you'd give do's and don'ts to Jeremy Corbyn? Um, I think the, the main thing I would say is enjoy it. Um, so at the moment he doesn't look as if he's enjoying it. You know, he sort of looks terribly grumpy and being very shirty with journalists. Um, but go out and enjoy it. I mean, I found it really quite liberating. Although to be fair, I, I think Jeremy Corbyn's always felt quite liberated <laughs> from his party <laughs> as it was. So maybe that doesn't apply to him. Um, but yeah, I think have a but have a cause. You know, it can't just be you know I'm disgruntled. I should have been allowed to be the Labour candidate and feeling sorry for yourself. Can't just be sort of sulkily self righteous. Although I think that is his <laughs> default mode. Um, but I think he needs to get out of that and kind of you know campaign for a I don't know kinder, gentler politics. <laughs> That's what he says before before people leave the party because of anti semitism. But but um, yeah, I think he's got to have a cause. The um the uh the thing of course that you because you stood for the stood as an independent, but some of your other colleagues, former Conservative MPs, went off and stood for the Lib Dems. So I just wondered uh, if you, if you had gone with the Lib Dems, this is the sort of thing you've missing out on. So we've had previously Ed Ed Davy has uh, knocked down the wall with a hammer. He's uh, opened a door. He's burst a balloon. Uh, it, there's there's been another Ed Davy stunt. I don't know if you've seen this. I think we can hear what happened. This is Ed Davy. There's a sort of uh, a wall of blue hay bales. 
and the sound you can hear is a bright yellow digger coming around the corner being driven by Ed Davey into the wall of hay bales knocking down the blue wall it's sort of like Boris Johnson's getting Brexit done stunt but but worse do you, do you regret now not joining the Lib Dems David <laughs> yeah well yeah when you think of the stunts that they do oof, tempting isn't it <laughs> <laughs> David, always good to speak to you. David Gott, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, um, and, uh, giving some advice to Jeremy Corbyn, something I bet you never thought you'd be asked to do. Uh, right, up next then is Deputy PMQ's Unpacked. Uh, it is uh, Dominic Raab versus Angela Rayner. Get on the YouTube channel. If you are watching on the YouTube channel, tell your friends, take the link, share the link. Uh, let people know that you can watch along as we pause the action uh, live. Uh, and then last bit we're here to, uh, un uh, to unpack the best of the West. And then we'll continue our chat about hotlines as well. Alice Beer from That's Life and um, Watchdog talks to us about hotlines too. It's Matt Jolly live on Times Radio and the YouTube channel. PMQ's Unpacked. Deputy PMQ's Unpacked is next. Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker. This is Times Radio. It's 12 o'clock. I'm Matt Jolly. This is Times Radio. In a moment, Deputy PMQ's unpacked. But first, a look at the headlines this lunchtime. Paul O'Grady has been described as a brilliant comedian and a fearless campaigner for equality following his death at the age of 67. The Queen Consort's among those paying tribute, saying she's deeply saddened by the death of her friend, who had a warm heart and infectious humour. They worked together in their support of Battersea Dogs and Cats Home. Two old RAF bases are expected to be earmarked for housing asylum seekers under plans to be announced by the government later. Boats and barges are also being considered as ministers seek to cut the cost of hotels for those having their applications processed. Humza Yousaf has been legally sworn in as Scotland's sixth first minister at the Court of Session. The 37-year-old is now Keeper of the Scottish Seal after pledging allegiance to the King. And Sir Alex Ferguson and Arsene Wenger are among the first managers to be inducted into the Premier League's Hall of Fame. Ferguson guided Manchester United to 13 titles, while Wenger won three with Arsenal. We'll have a full news and sports update at half past. But now, live on Times Radio and the Times Radio YouTube channel, it's time for Deputy... PMQ's Unpacked on Times Radio. Unpacking the politics and cutting through the crossfire. Order, order. I call Matt Chorley and Tim Shipman. And we say, no deputies here, we've got the real deal. Uh, Tim Shipman's here, how are you? I'm very well indeed. I was very impressed by that Lib Dem stunt. Much better than when they just knocked a hole in a wall with a tiny little hammer. <laughs> so they're coming on. I don't know if we can, we... can we show the people watching on the YouTube channel? So we might be able to do, we might be able to do that, see if we can... Uh, uh, so, yeah, if you want to see the, the clip, get on the YouTube channel, we'll show that to you in a moment. Obviously, no Ed Davey at PMQs, uh, not just because they don't get a question, but because it's deputies. Uh, what do we think, Angela Vader? You haven't asked me who the deputy leader of the Lib Dems is at this point. Um, it is Daisy Cooper. Oh, there we okay. are. Uh, what do you think Angela Rayner might go on today at PMQs? Do you know what? I've been racking my brains about this and I'm struggling, which is why I started off by talking about uh, the Lib Dems. Mm. Um, I mean, it seems unlikely they'll go on Raab's own sort of area of expertise, justice. Um, I mean, Stalmer has had a go about the migration stuff before. It could be that uh, Labour are feeling a little bit triggered by the prospect of migrants on various... Uh, objects. Objects, unseaworthy vessels, that sort of thing. Um, I mean, particularly because Dominic Raab, when he was on Sky this morning, didn't seem hugely enthusiastic about the barges. Well, that may be a way of driving a little bit of a wedge yeah. between uh, different parts of the government. That's always a good tactic. Um, I just wonder if it's one of those weeks where, you know, they might... If, if Starmer were there, you'd say it was a good week to just sort of take a step back and try and frame the local elections and yeah. say, there's all these things going wrong, why do you trust this lot? Um, with Rainer, I suspect she'll try and have some fun. It would be slightly curious if no-one mentioned the fact that Dominic Raab is still under investigation uh, for multiple uh, uh, counts of, of bullying. Um, we still don't have the result of that. Um but I suspect if anybody's going to get bullied today, it's probably going to be Dominic Raab by Angela Rayner. <laughs> Will he wink? That's the big question. Well, yes. The, the, as ever with these two, the slightly sinister uh, sexual subtext is uh, <laughs> always something that uh, is worth looking out for. Uh, so, uh, if you are watching along on the YouTube channel, let us know where you are. Uh, we've got Michael. He's in Melbourne. Uh, afternoon. Evening. Evening, Michael. Uh, John, ahoy from the heart of Sherwood Forest. Uh, Jonathan's in Guildford. 
Uh, Catherine says, will Rob wink today? Uh, Richard says, I really hope not. Wrong on so many levels. Um, uh, so we'll see uh, see uh, what actually comes. Oh, Carl says, I discovered Times Radio a couple of years ago now. It's a breath of fresh air. It really is. Well, that's nice, isn't it? There we are. I wonder if Rob should just make this winking thing his thing. He should just do it every time. And just do a lot of winking. It just can become a thing. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that they're going... I mean, both parties seem to think that electoral success lies in talking about crime. I mean, is it crime week? Is it number 10's crime week? We seem to be getting a crime announcement. Yeah, I mean, the way it's been going recently, it reminds me a little bit of the referendum campaign where they said it was turkey week every week, and uh, <laughs> this feels a bit like it's crime week every week at yeah. the moment. Um, yeah, it's the one bit of sort of crusty, vaguely right-wing policy that Labour is always happy to lean into because yeah. a, a lot of their That's traditional the voters, voters are, are yeah. the people who are affected by um, uh, by crime. Um, and, you know, the Tories, if they're not winning on crime, haven't got much else left. You know, traditionally they would expect to be ahead on the economy and on crime. Um, and if they see Labour stealing their clothes, they'll bash back harder. Well, here we go, then. But let's find out. Let's stop speculating about what Angela Wayne is going to do, and we can find out. This is Deputy PMQ's Unpacked, live on Times Radio and on the Times Radio YouTube channel. This is question number one from Angela Rayner. Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Angela Rayner. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and welcome back into the chair. And can I share the Deputy Prime Minister's words on our Baroness and our thoughts with her family today? And I'm sure the whole House will join me also in paying tribute to Paul O'Grady after his sad death was announced today. He was a national treasure and a true Northern star, and he will be greatly missed. Madam Deputy Speaker, this week the government announced their so-called anti-social behaviour policy. It's only taken 13 years. And look, I'll give him some credit. The Deputy Prime Minister knows firsthand the misery caused by thugs and their intimidating behaviour. Lurking with Ding. menace. Exploding in fits of rage. Creating seconds. a culture of fear. And maybe even, I don't know, throwing things. So can I ask him, under his new anti-social behaviour, does he think more bullies will be brought to justice? <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, I can reassure the House I've never called anyone scum. Which of course Angela Rayner did at Labour conference a couple of years ago, talking about Tory scum. Dominic Raab giving uh, Andrew Rayner his hardest bear stare there. No winks there. But, but if the right honourable lady is serious about standing up for communities and people who suffer at the scourge of antisocial behaviour, she'd back our plan to deal more swiftly uh, with these issues, to make sure that we ban drugs beyond the conventional ones, give police the powers they need. And if they really, if they really want to protect the public, they'll back our plans for parole reform to make sure the murderers, the terrorists, the child killers are not allowed out free to, to threaten other people and reintroduce the ministerial veto that that side took away. Oh, we had everything there. So uh, we should have explained at the very beginning the reason that uh, Keir Starmer and uh, Richard Sennack aren't there is because they're attending the funeral of Betty Boothford, which I think is also why Lindsay Hoyle isn't there, um, which was the Baroness that Andrew Rayner was talking about, and then paid tribute to Paul O'Grady as well. Um, and then just straight in, bringing together the two threads... I mean, you'd have to say it was quite a good opening question. It was question. quite a good gag. I it mean, as, a good an, as an opening gambit, it was as good as anything that Paul O'Grady would have probably managed on the same subject. Uh, cracking down on antisocial behaviour and uh, under these plans, will more bullies be brought to justice? Yeah, and then Rob sort of responds with his pre-prepared line, which, you know, fair enough, uh, Rayner uh, got, has got herself in hot water over the years for rather intemperate outbursts. But he did manage to say it in a way that was sinister enough that you could then believe that he's yeah. sometimes sinister, which was if lasers had come out of his eyes, slightly then, ruining uh, the effect. It would have, um, yeah, just it almost looked like the. It, I've like the, never called anyone it scum. Like, it would have looked like the uh, the video had frozen had it not been for Jeremy Hunt laughing in the background and the slight ticking of the vein in his the neck. vein, the vein. The vein having a slight uh, tweak, um, and then and then, but then I suppose that the risk for for her going off on this is that she just gives Dominic Raab the chance. It is his brief. He does know his stuff. He rattled through a whole load of things, and and he got to repeat his big announcement today, which is reintroducing the ministerial veto on 
serious offenders and how ministers can block them being released. I think that's all correct. And if she does six questions on it, I'm sure he'll um, uh, have every opportunity. Yeah. I'd be very surprised if she does, though. I suspect we'll keep moving. I, I, I wouldn't be... Uh, but let's see if she gets on to the shortages of tomatoes and whether that affected him, given that he's accused of throwing them at junior civil servants. Uh, right, let's go back there. Let, uh, let us know what you think uh, in the uh, in the comments on the um, on the YouTube channel. She's always worth the money. Love her, says Wendy. Ouch, says Elaine. Uh, Hunt is enjoying this, says Robert. Uh, let, uh, she's so much better than this uh, at this than Starmer. Uh, several people saying that. Uh, let us know what you think. Get online to the Times Radio YouTube channel. You can watch along uh, live. As we go back to the House of Commons. Question number two from Angela Rayner. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to see the ministerial code being introduced yep. under day two on that side of the House, because it's not just his department where antisocial behaviour is running out of control. It's happening across the country. Police officers disappearing from our streets, replaced by criminals, plaguing our towns and leaving people feeling unsafe. The truth is that the Conservatives are missing in action in the fight against crime. So can he tell his constituents and the public why, after 13 years of his party in government, there are now 6,000 fewer neighbourhood police officers on Britain's streets? Ma Madam Deputy Speaker, she really does have a brass neck because they voted against our funding of police recruitment and the 20,000 extra police officers. But what I will tell her and the whole House is crime is lower than it was under the last Labour government. Violent crime is halved, reoffending is seven percentage points lower, and if she really wants to stand up for the public and the victims of crime, they should back our bill to protect victims and protect the most vulnerable from serious, kill serious killers, rapists, and terrorists. Yeah. Well, got brass neck there. Um, Again, it's just he doesn't, you know, he probably knows all this stuff. He doesn't need to turn to the folds. No, exactly. There's uh, no frantic this flicking morning. through. He's, uh, he's on top of it. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure we're any much further forward after after that. Um, is that, I mean, the, I mean, the policing, cause isn't it a deadline? Is it for the end of this month, end of next month, as opposed to have got the 20,000 extra police officers, oh. which they love to talk about? But obviously, all they're doing is replacing the 20,000 that the coalition. That's right. And Cut. don't forget, this is a hugely, became a hugely iconic issue in both of the last two general election mm. campaigns. In 2017, um, you know, we had two terrorist attacks during the campaign and the Tories, who would normally expect to be solid on that stuff, got rather outflanked even by Jeremy Corbyn, who um, hammered them over police cuts um, and, you know, came quite close to winning that election. And then in 2019, when there was an attack on London Bridge again, um, Boris Johnson's crew were, were not going to make the same mistake twice and, uh, you know, came out very hard with, with a big crackdown on, on, on all of that and, and, you know, properly put their backs behind, uh, you know, more commitments to police officers. But as you rightly observe you know they're getting back to somewhere that they were before yeah. and um if that isn't sorted then you know you can see starmer who's obviously got a crime background himself having been a you know former boss of the uh, uh of the prosecution service <laughs> is um, he he's, he doesn't mention I, that. I, well, I mean, <laughs> no but it, you know this would be a gift to him is what yeah, i'm yeah, saying yeah, yeah, you yeah. know i mean he wouldn't even have to shoehorn it into conversation it would just be there wouldn't it um uh, lots of you lots of you enjoying Angela is indeed a better orator than Keir, says Carl. Uh, uh, Dominic Rob is basically a James Bond villain. Uh, <laughs> I love Ange, says someone on the text. Uh, 87212, uh, start the message with the word Tom, if you want to get in touch. Or we'll do post comments on the uh, YouTube channel. We go back then to the House of Commons. Question number three from Angela Rayner. Speaker, no one believes that there's more police on the streets and no one feels safer. Neighbourhood policing has gone down and not up. Let's talk about crime. He knows, as well as I do, that neighbourhood police can help prevent antisocial behaviour and knife crime. But trusted local police are also crucial to protecting women. Women feel unsafe on Britain's streets, always looking over our shoulder as we hurry to our front door. So can he tell me, under his watch as Justice Secretary, what is the charge rate for rape? Yeah. Can I address all of those elements of that? And first of all, say that the issue of rape and serious sexual violence against women is one of our top priorities. Oh. It is... she, asked, she asked what we're doing about it. Since 2019, 
police referrals of cases are doubled, CPS charges have doubled. She asked, she asked on my watch what has happened. The volume of convictions in rape cases increased by two thirds. And if she really wants to protect vulnerable women, whether it's rapists uh, or from rapists or other serious crimes, they will back our parole reforms, which will mean ministers able to prevent uh, them being released onto the public and cause more threats. Um, it's interesting, this debate about crime falling, crime down, crime up, there, there were two sets of statistics which there basically indeed. suit both sides. And they vary depending on whether you're in government or opposition. Yes. But the official crime figures are one thing, and then the British Crime Survey is the other, um, which tends to record people's sort of um, experience of crime. And that, I think, is generally regarded as sort of a more reliable uh, kind of guide to how people feel about these things than the numbers, which can go up or down a bit depending on whether people are bothering to report things. Um, um, so... And you get Labour and Tory grasping one or other of these sets exactly, of figures, so what is, so, depending so, on which direction they're going in and whether they're in government or opposition. So I'm just looking at um, something from 2020. So from last October, so not a, a million years ago. Uh, and at that point, the uh, the um, crime survey for England and Wales showed that uh, burglary, robbery and firearms enabled crime, among others, were falling compared to just before the pandemic. And I suppose, whereas uh, for some of those offences, they're going up in terms of things reported to the police, but what you want is people to report to the police. Um, and it's the gap between people who experience crime uh, but don't necessarily report it to uh, police. So both sides can latch onto figures. It's why one side can be right to say that the figures show it's going up and the other side can also be correct to say it's going down. Well, I'm pretty sure we're about to hear some different figures from Angela Rayner. I think you could well be right, but let's find out. Uh, we'll go back then uh, to the House of Commons. Matt Trolley and Tim Shipman with Deputy PMQs Unpacked. Uh, we go back to the House of Commons. Question number four from Angela Rayner. Angela Rayner. He says that rape conviction has gone up. What he really means is that 300 women will be raped today while he boasts about an increase of 0.5%. He hasn't answered my question, Madam Deputy Speaker, because he's too ashamed of the answer. 1.6% of rapists face being charged for their crime. 1.6%. Let that sink in. A woman goes through the worst experience of her life. She summons up the courage to relive that horrendous experience, to tell the police in detail about her assault. But she only has a 1.6% chance of action being taken. Over 98% of rapists will never see the inside of a courtroom, let alone a prison. And the rest of those brave women, Madam Deputy Speaker, they keep looking over their shoulders and hope the perpetrator doesn't choose tonight to take their revenge for reporting the incident to the police. In the last 13 years of the Tory government, more than half a million cases of rape have been recorded by the police. But the charge rate for those attacks have collapsed. He has served under five Tory Prime Ministers and had three years as Justice Minister. And on his watch, rapists are left to roam the streets. So will he apologise to those victims who will never get justice because of his failures? Yeah. I'll first of all say to the Right Honourable Lady, the conviction rate measured by the CPS, the leader of the Labour Party used to be in charge of the CPS, he might want to point this out. Well, actually, the, the, the conviction rate has gone up. It is now at 69%. We are doing much more to support the victims of rape when they come forward. Well, they're talking a good game. In fact, we have quadrupled funding for victims since 2010. And if she looks at the latest data, the time it's taken from charge to completion of a rape case has come down by, come, come down by 10 weeks or 70% in the last three months alone. She should get her facts straight, particularly when talking about such a sensitive issue. Well, I mean, it was pretty impassioned stuff. And, yeah, that was and punchy and, and, proper, and very effective. angry, and I expect that, yeah. you know... So, again, I think we're talking about different stats here. So she says 1.6% of rapists face being charged. He says 69% conviction rate. Now, my reading of that is that's 69% of the 1.6. Well, I think it's 69% of the ones that get to court. Yeah. The so point you... being, if you get into court, 
there's not they're not the courts are much better at getting testimony from yeah. witnesses they're much better at looking after the victims they're much better at not putting them in a room with the person that accuses of, yeah. uh, of of raping them um they're getting more convictions. The, the point Rayner's making is that a lot of stuff never gets anywhere Doesn't near get a court, the, yeah. courtroom. So Sometimes, if only 1% of cases lead to a charge, Exactly, it's great if 69% of those charged lead to a conviction, but there's... You know, these are let's be frank. These are complicated yeah. cases. Sometimes there are grey areas um, uh, about what's happened, and getting evidence is quite difficult. And um, and let's be also honest that a lot of women start that process and then find it a terrible ordeal yeah. and don't actually want to pursue and it. Ends up being, um, having to relive it. But there is definitely a sort of gender imbalance in all this stuff. Um, I think anyone who has uh, female friends or wives or sisters knows that this is, you know, what Angela Rayner is talking about there, about walking along the street and wondering whether you've got to look over your shoulder or whether you need to cross to the other path. Strategizing how to get home safely is a big part of most women's lives. And I don't think a lot of men understand that or appreciate it. And, um, you know, I thought she was extremely effective in, in her questioning. But, you know, Rob, to be fair, is on top of his brief. Um, he, he answered that in a, in a, you know, an effective but sober way. And, um, you know, I think, ironically, this is, we're sort of, uh, this is quite a good session, really. It's quite good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which seems to be what uh, lots of people are saying on uh, on the Times Radio YouTube channel as well. Uh, go, Angela. She's just warming up. Uh, someone pointing out, uh, Dominic Rob saying they're talking a good game. But well, that's a compliment, isn't it? I mean, that's that's essentially, you know, he inadvertently complimented her on uh, duffing him up. Uh, and then uh, somebody saying if you... At a charge rate of 1.6% means a man could could carry out 43 rapes before there's a 50-50 chance he'll face a charge. When you put it in that context, that's, look, that is uh, extraordinary. But we've still got two more questions to go. So let's go back to the House of Commons. This is question number five from Angela Rayner. Angela Rayner. Madam Deputy Speaker, you won't apologise for the government failures on charge rates and 69% of 1.6%. Is that really something to boast about? Yeah. Let me ask him about an issue which is directly his responsibility. On his watch, rape survivors are waiting on average more than three years for their cases to come to court. The Honourable Member talked about ten week, ten week reduction. Three years, Deputy, uh, Deputy Leader. Three years. The so ten weeks is not anything to boast about. Exactly. The, those three years from the day of the assault to the final day of court, is it any wonder that from April till September last year, 175 trials for rape and other serious sexual offences have had to be dropped because the victim could no longer cope with the delay. Yeah. So let me ask him, when will he apologise to all those women denied justice because of his failure to keep to sort the court backlog? Yeah. Well, she ignores the impact on the court backlog of the pandemic or indeed the CBA strike. But let me tell her what we're doing. Let me tell you what we're doing. We've quadrupled funding for victims since 2010, quadrupled the funding provided by the last Labour government. We launched the 24-7 support line so that when those victims of that appalling crime come forward, they get the support they need. We've increased the number of independent sexual violence advisers uh, to over 1,000, uh, and we're making sure that women uh, that suffer this appalling crime can give pre-recorded uh, evidence in court. We're doing everything that we can, and as I said, uh, the, the rates are coming down. Uh, and we will keep uh, uh, taking action. Sarah, is she really, if the Labour Party were really serious about this, they wouldn't have voted against longer sentences for dangerous, violent, and sexual offenders in the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act, and she would get behind our Victims and Prisoner Bill today? Yeah. It's interesting that, that she's fallen back on the, the tactic of will you apologise? But then when you've got MPs shouting out as well, and he's rattling off statistics and hotlines and all that. It does. It's clearly a terrible situation. Yes. And you don't want to fall into the trap, which he's, I'd say Dominic Raab is just on the edge of, of trying to make it sound like everything's hunky dory. Yes. I thought, I mean, he's, you know, he's defending his position. Um, but uh, as we know, uh, he's not Mr. Empathy. And yeah. that's coming through a little bit now. Yeah. It's, it's, um, uh, I, I also wonder whether he, um, 
thinks he just keeps stonewalling this, just keep repeating the lines and nothing will come of it. But I, th I actually think her earlier challenges is the sort of thing that is going to be on, will probably make the news, will go all over social media. And his response will be very easy to clip up and make look like you're actually yeah, probably and even less sensitive. And it also plays a little bit into the reputation he's already got for being a bit sort of cold and yeah. uh, and a bit, you know, sort of technocratic rather than uh, one of those politicians who uh, empathises with the victim. Lots of you, loads of you are um, following this on the uh, on the YouTube channel, showing that uh, uh, Angela Wayne is showing more outward passion, says Richard. Uh, Starmer is passionate, but in a quietly, quietly way. I'm not sure it's quite the same thing. Um, well, she once did an interview with the Sunday Times magazine, which is well worth digging out if you haven't read it, where she basically says, I overshare, Keir undershares. And uh, <laughs> there's a happy it's as good a description the of the two of them as has ever been coined, really. Uh, well, let's go back then into the last question. The last question from uh, Deputy PMQ's Unpacked. Uh, this is Angela Rayner. Angela Rayner. Madam Deputy Speaker, not a word of apology. No sense of responsibility and not even a shred of shame. The reality is, while people in Britain feel more and more unsafe, he seems to spend all of his time trying to save his own job and none of his time on his actual job. And it's not just me that thinks so. The Prime Minister clearly doesn't trust him to deal with antisocial behaviour because he's given that job to the levelling up secretary. <laughs> the way things are going and reports are to be believed, this might be your last PMQs. So let's look at the highlights. A criminal justice on its knees. The largest court backlog on record. Rape victims waiting for justice. And through it all, he managed to wrap up 24 formal complaints from his own civil servants. So can he say today, will he walk before he's pushed? Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, one thing never changes. She always comes with the usual bluster and political opportunism. Oh. Let me... Let me tell, let me tell the right honourable lady what we've been doing, what I've been doing this week. We've delivered new legislation to support the victims of crime, including rape, and to protect the public. We've delivered a plan to stamp out antisocial behaviour, and we've supported families with their energy bills. What's she done? What have the Labour front bench done? They tried to block our small boats bill, and that's the difference between them and us. We did deliver for Britain. She likes to play her political games. There we are. Uh, that was a sort of classic Rainer ending then. Just, yes. just park everything else. I've just been saying, now I'm going to take the mic and uh, obviously referring to the, the ongoing, still to be concluded inquiry into uh, Dominic Raab's treatment. I think the long, part of the problem has been, I was talking to somebody who was involved in this, it's been going on for so long that people keep coming forward, which adds to the pile, which means it's taking longer, which means more people come forward. It's sort of never it's ending. It's a bit like writing a book on Brexit, to be honest. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so uh, th there's been some suggestion it might come to a conclusion soon. I mean, it would be most unlike Rishi Sunak to announce that uh, Dominic Raab was resigning, I don't know, in the middle of the Easter holidays when no one was paying any attention to, to, to politics because uh, he definitely would have done that sort of thing with his um, his tax returns. Uh, and then accusing the uh, the opposition of uh, political opposition and opportunism. Yeah, that's sort of the point really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and then it, and then claim the, the Labour Labour Party who haven't been in government for thirteen years haven't done anything to change the country. No, apart from all apart from all this opposing, all this opposing. Uh, let's have a look at some of uh, she's just flailing, asking for apology that's uncalled for or will therefore not be forthcoming. Says Fabi. She's relishing this. Says Wendy. Uh, when, this well, is both good, of those can be true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John Michael says uh, whenever a politician accuses someone of playing politics, they're losing. I mean, that, that, that basically sums it up, doesn't it? If, yeah, it when yeah. you're... Uh, yeah, she came with much better pre-prepared lines than he did. Yeah, and he, you know, I think he fought her to a score draw on maybe three of the six questions um, because he knew his patch, but um, uh, it was a... It was a reign of victory, I think. And ultimately, it's because uh, the government has chosen to go onto this uh, uh, territory. Yes, because they know it's a concern to the public, but their record isn't brilliant. No, when the you know it's one of those areas where, like the health service, where COVID caused just an absolute car yeah. crash, which is one system. of the points he was making in terms yeah. of the the court system and so on. And I suppose the I mean it, the other thing is um, the the economy is not a position of strength for the Conservatives. So at least if they're having an argument about crime, 
the Labour Party aren't talking about the state of the economy. Uh, well, that's true. Um, you know, and as you say, they, it, it's an interesting one where an army, you know, the Red Army is prepared to go and fly on the terrain that the Blue Army has chosen. Yeah. Um, and they still emerged um, having landed a few blows today, I think. Yeah. I think you could... Uh, I think, well, well, let us know what you think. How did, uh, how did Angela Rayner do? Because um, the last one, because no, they're off them now for two weeks, aren't they? Uh, I think that's Do you think Dominic Raab will still be there after the Easter holidays? I have no idea, because as you say, this thing seems to have... Um, I'll believe it when I see it, when when the report actually comes yeah. in. Um, it's hard to see how he's going to escape unscathed from 24 complaints, but... Um... And do you think... I, I, th I was always struck, it was a bit on you... I was, quite, I was a bit surprised that Rishi Sunak gave him the job. It didn't feel like he had to bring him back in, particularly as Deputy Prime Minister and sort of putting a target on his back all over again. I think that was largely down to Raab actually really burying himself during the leadership contest mm. to try and take out Liz Truss. He was... He, he was the sort of... being a, a, a suicide bomber Yeah, or I mean, he was, he, he was really properly the point of the spear and did willingly blow up his own career to try and take her out and didn't succeed. So I think um, there was an element of Sunak feeling like he owed him one. Um, yeah. But, yes, um, I don't, you know... Uh, I was speaking to a civil servant yesterday who uh, suggested that uh, the number of friends that Dominic Raab currently has at the top of government could be found on uh, a farmer's hand who's had an accident with a threshing machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see if that if uh, if he is still there um, after the uh, after these debate when we're back with normal normal uh, PNQs. I wonder who it will be if it's not him. Uh, that's a good question. Probably, probably not Jeremy Hunt. Probably not. You don't normally put the Chancellor up in those situations, even though he's... Well, Os did Osborne do it for a bit? Post-election? Did I he do a, a very short period. After the 2015 maybe. election? I mean, the, the Chancellor would traditionally be the highest-ranking Cabinet Minister after the Prime Minister. Um, but, uh, yeah. Well, I've enjoyed their Who do you sparring. think? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, have, they have been good. They have been it's particularly sort of, good. It's a bit like a double act, isn't it? You yeah. know, you've got the sort of... Uh, the Eric Morecambe character on one side and... Dear old Rob is the sort of Ernie Wise straight man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we'll hear from more from Dominic Rob in just a sec. Uh, Lara Spit will come galloping in with the best of the rest. Uh, she's been watching so that you don't have to. She'll bring us the best of the rest in uh, just a moment. We'll also talk hotlines uh, with Alice Beer uh, of Watchdog and this morning, and that's life. And we'll do the quiz as well. Uh, first, though, let's get a news and sport update. Across the UK, on DAB, online, and on your smart speaker. This is Times Radio. Thanks, Matt. Good afternoon. Deputy Labour leader Angela Rayner has attacked the government's recently announced anti-social behaviour measures during PMQs this lunchtime. Ms Rayner also questioned the government's record on crime. In response to that, Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab had this to say. Crime is lower than it was under the last Labour government. <laughs> Violent crime is halved. Reoffending is seven percentage points lower. And if she really wants to stand up for the public and the victims of crime, they should back our bill to protect victims and protect the most vulnerable from serious, killer, serious killers, rapists and terrorists. Yeah. Meanwhile, the immigration minister is about to make a speech on plans that would place migrants in military bases, barges and ferries while they wait for a decision on their application. Critics say the proposals are unsuitable for those who have fled war. In other news, the Queen Consort says she's deeply saddened at the death of her friend Paul O'Grady, who's passed away unexpectedly at the age of 67. The TV presenter's been remembered for his campaigning on equality and animal rights, as well as being a brilliant comedian. The jury in the trial of the man accused of murdering nine-year-old Olivia Pratt-Corbell has been sent out to consider its verdicts. Thomas Cashman is accused of firing shots at her home in Liverpool in August last year. And the Bank of England says Britain's banking sector is resilient to rising interest rates. That's despite the collapse of major global lenders like Credit Suisse and Silicon Valley Bank. To the weather, bands of rain and showers moving northeastwards across most parts, which can be heavy at times, especially in the west. Some bright spells this afternoon too, though, and feeling relatively mild despite strong winds. Time for a look at the sport now. Here's Toby Gillis. Spain's team of superstar footballers are being accused of sour grapes after a shock 2-0 defeat to Scotland last night. 
They were beaten in the European Championship qualifier, a result which gives the Scots a perfect start to their group with two wins from two. The victory is described in the Times as the most fabulous of Scottish triumphs since France were beaten in 2007. But Rodri, Spain's captain who plays his club football at Manchester City, described Scotland's style as rubbish and not football. While defender David Garcia put the loss down to the grass on the pitch at Hamden Park being too long. It's fair to say Charlie Adam, a recently retired Scotland midfielder, was not impressed with the accusations when he spoke with Talk Sport. What it's called is good game management, <laughs> using the brains, you know, not going silly. You know, listen, Rodri's an experienced player, played played the highest level, won yeah. most trophies. He's been doing it for his career as well. So don't let the Spanish kid you on that this is not what they've been up to for the last, you know, 20, 30 years. And, you know, it's a, a confidence boost going into the summer results. That's For me, that's what it is. We talk about the biggest result in Scotland's history. It's, it's the here and now, and it's, it's a perfect result for us going forward. And the Times understands meetings between Manchester United officials and potential investors in the club has transformed the landscape around its future ownership. Multiple interested organisations met with representatives of the owners over the last fortnight, but one in particular saw an opportunity that may make a full sale less likely. Times Radio's Kane Reeves reports. Fans of Manchester United almost unanimously want current owners the Glazer family to sell up. British-led and Qatari bids were believed to make a full sale most likely, but an American investment group, Elliott Investment Management, has now changed its plans. Initially, Elliott offered financing to other bidders, but the potential future earning power from any expansion of the club's stadium offered an attractive alternative. The Times now understands that Elliott has changed its offer to include buying their own minority stake, a move that could prove valuable to investors, but infuriate supporters desperate for the end of the Glazer dinner. You can read more on these stories on the Times website or app. This is Times Radio. Can you guess who's coming to McDonald's Happy Meal? I'll give you some clues. There's a buzzing honey lover, a little birdie with a big voice, and a dragon with a rainbow tummy. It's time to find out who is behind the mask. That's right, the Masked Singer has arrived at McDonald's Happy Meal. Don't forget, you can enjoy some delicious apple slices and grapes too. Some fun, some food, it's all inside this Happy Meal. <whistles> Until the 2nd of May, from 11am, includes one pre-selected toy or book. The Masked Singer range comprises toys only, while stocks last. At Villa Plus, we've been matching people to their perfect villa holiday for over 30 years. So whether you want a villa for a family reunion, plus plenty of smiles, or a child-friendly villa, plus a place to escape. We're here to help with exclusive hand-picked villas plus friendly in-resort teams. Book your perfect summer holiday now at villaplus.com. Villa Plus, it all adds up to amazing. John Pienaar, a drive. This afternoon from five on Times Radio. Matt Chorley on Times Radio with Net Wealth. Try the free digital dashboard that helps you track, plan and invest your wealth. Go to netwealth.com. Very good afternoon. It's Matt Chorley on Times Radio. Uh, Tim Shipman's still here. We've been doing uh, PMQs Unpacked. It was deputy PMQs today with Dominic Barb and Angela Rayner. Lama Spirit's been watching the best of the West so that you don't have to, keeping on the uh, on the, on the back benches. Uh, overall, Lama, was it any good? It was, yeah. Oh, it was okay. interesting. OK, we better get on with it then. Who have we got first? So we've got Mari back first, uh, who is obviously the SNP's Westminster deputy uh, leader who leads on uh, that story that we saw over the weekend about some senior Conservative figures uh, being kind of duped into possibly accepting very large sums uh, yeah, for Matt outside. Hanco Matt Hancock, um, 10 grand a day. Uh, and was I think we'll listen to it now, but very interesting also for what we didn't hear, which was any uh, government line that went hard on divisions within the SNP. There was a minister who said to me yesterday that obviously the uh, strategy from the government is to come smother them with love in this respect and they're not going to bite and so I think the lack of illusion from Dominic oh, Raab to those internal tensions was interesting so we'll just take a listen to that now. The Deputy Leader of the SNP, Mari Black. Yeah. Thank you Madam Deputy Speaker and I also wish to send my warm regards to the family of Paul O'Grady, the legendary drag queen for all he's done for my community. I also want to congratulate Hamza Youssef as he becomes yeah. first minister of Scotland. As the... As the first Scots Asian and Muslim to hold such an office, I'm sure the whole house will send his warm regards. Now, in recent days, video footage has emerged of 
the former Chancellor and the former Chair of the 1922 Committee, offering their services for £60,000 on top of their MP's salary. The former Health Secretary offered his wisdom for £10,000 a day. Going once. Can I ask the Deputy Prime Minister, when he is inevitably booted out of office, what will his going rate be? Ah. <laughs> well, can, I, can I welcome her to uh, the, the Chamber? Uh, the, system of, the system of declarations is there to ensure transparency and accountability. And of course, the Conservatives backed tightening up those rules uh, to make sure that there couldn't be any lobbying. Uh, but can I also join with, accept uh, uh, to take her up on her uh, tribute to the, first, uh, the new First Minister of Scotland. The Prime Minister spoke to him last night. Uh, we welcome him to his place. And of course, the government will want to work constructively with him in the best interests of the people of Scotland. Well, it's a bit of a shame we didn't find out what Dominic Raab's uh, going rate going rate was going to be. It's quite a good joke, though. <laughs> quite a good joke. Yeah, it was. It was interesting. And the second question that we uh, won't listen to on that, but the follow up was uh, Dominic Raab very much enjoyed making some of the uh, shadow front benches squirm by reference to their outside earnings, with particular reference to obviously uh, the quite sizable sums that uh, the shadow foreign secretary David Lammy has made that too. Is. So it's fair to say that both enjoyed that series of exchanges. It's touching though to hear, wasn't it, in boasting that oh we tightened up the rules? Well, they tightened them up because Boris Johnson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tried to get Owen Patterson, who had mm. been caught banged to rights by the um, Standards Commissioner, off the hook and yeah. changed the rules to protect him. And when it all blew up in his face, they then tightened the rules, yeah, to tighten the rules instead. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, yes, it's good to see they're now owning that. <laughs> Uh, we should explain the reason it's deputies today is because uh, the funeral of Betty Boothroyd, the former Commons Speaker, is, is taking place this lunchtime. So uh, Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer and Lindsay Hoyle, the Commons Speaker, are, are attending that, which is why it's a sort of uh, deputies, deputies day at, at PMQs. Where are we going next, Clara? We're going to Chris Bryant, the Labour MP, uh, who asked a question about uh, drag queens and uh, I think pulls uh, Dominic Raab into a slight pickle as well as an illusion on uh, what sort of cultural issues we might see them go on in the next election. So have a listen. Excellent. Let's take a listen. Sir Chris Bryant. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I don't know whether the Deputy Prime Minister ever met Lily Savage um, or has ever spent a night out at the Royal Vauxhall Tavern, but Lily was... I can take him some time if he wants to go. Um, the, um, but it's a well-known game park in, the, actually, yes. in South London. But, the, um, but Lily was performing at the height of the AIDS crisis in 1987. Um, when police officers raided the pub, arrested her, amongst others. Um, they were wearing rubber gloves because supposedly they were protecting themselves from contracting HIV from touching gay men. Lily amazingly said at the time, um, Oh, lads, you've come to do the washing up. That's great. Um, her alter ego, Paul O'Grady, campaigned acerbically and hilariously for elderly people, for care workers, um, against oppression of every kind. Isn't it time we in this country celebrated our naughty, hilarious drag queens and comics yeah. of every kind who inspire us to be a better and more generous nation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman. I totally agree with him. And uh, Paul Grayson was an uh, incredible comic, but he also... But, but Lily, but Paul Grady, but Lily, but in terms of Lily Sage also, I think some of that comedy broke glass ceilings and broke uh, boundaries in a way that certainly politicians would struggle to do. So I agree with that. I also think it shows how we need uh, greater, more rambunctious free speech, and we need to avoid the wokery and the limitations on comedy, which I'm afraid both of them would have had no time for. Well, well, that was all a very good point, well made, apart from getting his name wrong. Um, <laughs> Dominic Roberts of the generation that remembers Larry Grayson, another yes. gay comic. Oh, who, well, they're all... That door, he used to say. Um, um, he do, did, do, do, I, I, all I mean, over I, the I telly. I wouldn't necessarily have had uh, Dominic Rob down as a Larry Grayson nope. fan. Maybe he did used to enjoy the... Um, the generation go. Interesting point that um, uh, Lara, did, what, what Chris Barn was doing there is there is this sort of cultural war round now going on, as ever it started in America, but we seem to be importing it here about drag queens and how if a drag queen re reads a book in a library, this is a terrible outrage. 
It was interesting in that question, wasn't it, that uh, Dominic Robb seemed to at the beginning be taking quite a warm and, and similar approach to that pose in the question by Chris Bryant. Only after uh, getting that name wrong and being forced to correct himself did he uh, go on the line that it was somehow related to the kind of, you know, these woke culture wars uh, that we see. And I think there'll be a number of um, conservatives, especially who might not necessarily take so kindly to that approach. But I wonder if uh, making that mistake and being wrong footed on that uh, name as he was kind of maybe was one of the reasons why he took what might be regarded as potentially insensitive. Uh, uh, and I've uh, hot off the WhatsApp. Hot off the WhatsApp. It's not even clear he was a Larry Grayson fan. I'm told Paul Grayson was a former Leicester rugby player who played fly half for <laughs> England a fair bit and was back up to Johnny Wilkinson. Well, there we are. So there we go. He may not have had any recollection of the generation game. He may just have had a rugby player in his mind. That would that make spoils it a bit, sense. doesn't it? Slightly more sense. Uh, can we hear it? Can we hear that again? Let's just hear it again. Yeah, I thank uh, the honourable gentleman. I totally agree with him. And uh, Paul Grayson was an uh, incredible comic, but he also. Well, no, he wasn't, though, was he? But at best. Lovely he was drop a goal. <laughs> Can we have a one, just have it one more time? Yeah, I thank uh, the honourable gentleman. I totally agree with him. And uh, Paul Grayson was an uh, incredible comic, but he also. Well, there we are. There we are. I suspect the internet is going to enjoy that all day to know. Oh, there's one called Paul Grayson. There's a columnist at the Mirror as well, apparently, called Paul Grayson. It's it's just that, I mean, you know, what can I tell you? This is live I mean, updating. it's hard to know it, what's more likely, that Dominic Raab watches the Generation game, reads the Mirror or watches rugby. I think it's more likely the rugby, isn't Probably it? Probably the rugby. Well, thanks for that, Lara. I enjoyed Thank that. You. We covered a lot of ground there. Uh, Lara Spirit there, and you can catch Lara in your inbox. 2.30. 2.30. Uh, with uh, the PMQ's Unpacked Red Box special. Uh, Time subscribers can just go to thetimes.co.uk forward slash red box. Somebody's just texted in saying, do you ever get names wrong? Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, you're more than welcome to take the mic when I do. Uh, and people do, I believe. And people do. Is that very, very much so. Very much so. You haven't uh, lit up the Twitters for a while. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Timmy Mallett. Uh, thank you for coming in. Uh, Chief political commentator of the Sunday Times. Uh, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Uh, see you in a well th three weeks. Lara Croft. Lara Croft. Thanks so much for coming in. Excuse me. <laughs> Slightly more complimentary than doing... Timmy Mallet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of another famous Tim. Hemman. I'll take Hemman. Hemman. Yeah. Take Tim Hemman. Fist bump. <laughs> we, I really think this could be your year. Yeah. 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 Uh, very <laughs> never good. Is, is uh, very it good. Never right. Is. Up next, uh, we've got to do some of your uh, your hotlines as the government launches yet another hotline. Uh, we're going to speak to Alice Beer from That's Life and uh, Watchdog and This Morning to see if hotlines really work. And we'll do the quiz as well. This is Matt Jolly on Times Radio with Net Wealth. For a clear review of your financial world, go to netwealth.com. Carol Walker on Times Radio. Trusted news and industrial strength debate. The Home Secretary has defended her handling of the migrant crisis and described the increased numbers of people coming across the channel in small boats as an invasion. Plus a peerless lineup of guests and commentators. I know the importance of taking legal advice into account. Unrivaled opinion and insight. Has she done enough to end the questions over her judgment? Carol Walker.